Well, hello, everybody. Welcome once again to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray. Today, I will be reviewing some classic and more up-to-date Lit RPG uh, audiobooks for you. Today, I'm going to be beginning with Neverfall, Mark of the Hero, a game lit RPG series by C. Wintertide. That's who wrote that. Narrated by Tim McKiernan. 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 <clears throat> Man, I'm Scott Irish, and I can't even talk right now. Uh, and the book length is 11 hours and 57 minutes. Okay. This isn't turn-based combat, which is good news in some ways. He gave them a tight smile. It means we can attack the hell out of it without having to wait for our turn. But it also means that the King Rat doesn't have to wait either. Mac, did it have any weaknesses? Strength or special attacks? Mac rubbed his beard as he strove to remember what he saw. Nothing has to the first two, but it had one special attack called a swarm. Don't know what that is. We're likely going to find out, Luke said. All right, Alicia, you're our tank. You likely can take more damage than any of us combined, so you should be up front and center. Of course. She crossed her massive arms over her chest. Mac, you're next up on the front lines. Make that axe count. So let me start off by saying Neverfall isn't a bad book. It, it, it is a fair bit predictable, and it definitely has fairy tale moments. <clears throat> on the upside, this is one of the better books that you can use to get a young listener into the genre. I would almost call it a young adult, but I'm afraid to go there because I honestly, it isn't, isn't, it isn't overly gory and filled with sex. And a lot of swearing. I mean, honestly, I can't remember if there's any F bombs or S grenades or B mines. Do you guys know what B mines are or S S grenades? Never mind. Um, But don't hold me to that, okay? But I still think it would be really good for kids. Um, Now, there were some issues, and I had had a couple, three or four issues with the book. Uh, Nothing that the book can't survive and will make you not want to read it, but one of my biggest complaints uh, that come about a book in lit RPG is the amount of time it takes to actually get into the game that they are playing. The game that is the, the book is about should be entered in a rather relatively rapid pace. Okay. I can go maybe two chapters in before I would think what's going on here. Now here, I'm just going to put it out like this. This is how I looked at it. The book is About 12 hours long. And it's seriously, and and I'll tell you how I know this, it takes about four hours for the characters to actually get into the game to play Neverfall. Four hours. Four. That is one-third of the book, because four, and then out of 12, That's yeah, that's one-third. Me not good math, but me no no one-thirds. All right. Um... One third of the book is just set up. Uh, and it's just, I don't know. That is literally four hours is half the length of most lit RPG books. Okay, just for example, um, James Hunter's Rogue Dungeon is seven hours and 41 minutes long. And I say this all the time. Setup is fine. I will always read a book and for setup. I, I, I think you need to have things set up. I think you need to know what's going on. But it shouldn't take more than one or two chapters to get the characters into the darn game. No more. No more than that. I don't really care, you know, about a lot of stuff that happens in the real world. My interest, and unless that real world is going to play a heavy, heavy, heavy part, is going to be in the game world. That's where my interest is going to be. Four hours... I know this because I got out of my car right as they were about to enter the game world. And it had like eight hours and two minutes left. Okay. Four hours is way too long. Okay. Again, I I don't care what happens in the real world. Okay. The real world is boring. I live in the real world. I don't need to know all of the details. You can say there's a relative dying. The family's broke. There's any other typical trope that in, in this genre that comes up. You can say any of that in one chapter. One. One. One and done. One chapter and then you're in the game. If you really want to dole out all that info because you need to, do it in the flashback. 
do it in the flashback. You get like, you know, so many parts of the game in there. And then you remember back when your mom was <coughs> cacking up blood or, you know, <clears throat> as, as you're about to go and, and, and attack the big berserker, you think my dad was never there. And this guy looks like a big role model for me. I wish he was my papa. You, whatever it is, you, you, you do that sort of thing in the flashback and then you move on into the game. And then that way you dole out the information piecemeal and get the reader interested in what's going on rather than, and I'm serious, I, after a, a little while, I was like, are they even going to play this game? Because, you know, I, I didn't realize how long the book was. I didn't realize it was 12 hours. <clears throat> and like I said, I know I had been listening to that book for at least four hours because I had been driving all day doing things, um, going different places. And it was two hours here, two hours there. And I was four hours in from when I started it. And most books, like I say, I'd have been over halfway done. If it was Rogue Dungeon, I'm halfway through. Not the case. It bugs me. It bugs me. It bugs me. It bugs me. Four hours to get into it is crazy. Get into the action as soon as you can. Uh, like I say, if you need to backtrack, backtrack. But don't, don't, don't take forever to do it. Okay? So here's the rundown. A kid whose mother is dying ends up going into a video game to save, well, to help her, amongst other things. I don't want to spoil anything. But honestly, if you don't know half the mysteries that are popping up in the game, uh, then you're not paying attention, or I should say in the book, okay? Because everything here is pretty predictable. I, I, I literally had never any questions or doubts as to what was going to happen, because as much as I, I, I like to think I'm a super genius, I know I'm not all that smart. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm pretty good with mysteries, but I pretty much said I know who the kid is and I know how they're going to get into the game. And I mean, it was just it was just like one, two, three, four, five, click, 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 click. All the, the tumblers were in place and the door open. Uh, it, it, like I say, that is the biggest problem for me with the book is its predictability. Um, I, I would say some people might say that the characters are a little flat and, and they, there is some flatness to characters. There's. Maybe not a lot of depth to them, but I mean, if you want to compare depth, I, I have another book I'm reviewing later in the show. Pick up the Zombie Slayer and look at the characters there compared to the characters here. The characters here have a lot more going on for them than um, the other book did. All right, there's just a lot more happening here. So he basically, the kid goes in um, to save his mother. Because he gets paid to go help a rich businessman who is basically like Bill Gates or Elon Musk, full of money and super creative. And they were supposed to go in um, to the game at the highest possible levels with the best gear to start off on the final boss, who they have to defeat. Uh, but predictably, that goes... I mean, you get the idea. I think you already know from what I've said um, what's going to happen. Do you think they're really going to show up in their super armor and uh, be full powered and do everything? Let's just say from there it's a struggle to survive and face the final lord. Now, Tim McKiernan does do a pretty decent job on the story. He does voices, both male and female, pretty well, and really goes out of his way to make the Darth Lord sound like a Darth Vader if he were a heavy drinker. And that's fine because that's part of the joke in the book is, you know, the Dark Lord is Darth Vader and the main hero is Luke. Okay, so it's Luke versus Darth Vader. And it's, it's just one of those little ha-ha moments. And if you find it funny, fantastic. If you don't, that's great. It's not a big part of the book, but it's just there. Now, the only thing I really took umbrage with with his voice was that his Dark Lord voice and his Dragon voice were pretty much the same thing. I would have liked to see him done something different for the Dragon because the Dark Lord plays a pretty good prominent part, and he talks a lot. The Dragon, not so much. But if, if I had lined him up and said... Pick out who this is without saying like what was going on. You'd never be able to tell them apart. I, at least I don't think so. I think it was very, very similar in my opinion. Uh, I did enjoy him a great deal, uh, and I look forward to hearing more from him in the future. Uh, McTiernan, McTiernan, what the heck? I, my my father is going to kill me when he sees this. Scott Irish, and I can't say a simple McTiernan. Okay, uh, I think he's a really good fit for lit RPG. I really do. I think he's a really good good narrator, and I, I think I'd like to hear more from him in the future. I think he carried this book pretty well. 
And I think he made it more interesting than what it probably could have been or what it, on, on paper um, because he adds a lot to it. You know, I would say like a good narrator can elevate a story. And I think here he does that too um, because I'm going to just come right out. There was another thing that really ground my gears, you know, grind my gears. Um, and there, there's like a trendy matrix moment and you'll recognize it if you listen. Uh, and you know my stance on death in books. Death should matter and people should die. If you have a game where characters can die permadeath, then make all deaths permanent. Don't wuss out. That's my final word on that, okay, for this book. <clears throat> that, that really was my, my big, eh, and it took, I literally took a, a lot off for that moment alone just because it was such a wimp out and it was such a cheat. Uh, and I don't want to spoil anything, but you'll know the Trinity moment when it comes. Uh, it, it just was unfair to you as a listener because I was like, holy crap. He just did something really major. This kid, he, or this guy, you know, Wintertide, he's got some balls. He just did something really big. And then he yanks that rug right out for underneath of you. And I really got upset with that because it's such a cheat and it's such a weak writing way of doing things. Uh, there are so many things you should do to avoid that situation that altogether, altogether. My final score, and, uh, and I'm being generous because I thought the book, even though it's predictable and it kind of has like s some characters who are very, you know, predictable. I mean, like, honestly, if you go back to the characters, there, there's, there's numerous different characters in the book, um, that he, he that the main character hangs out with Luke. Um, it, and you can just pick them out and you say, that's the angry dwarf or the, the dwarven fighter. Uh, there's the, 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 the Luke queen who just wants to get all the loot. Uh, and then there's this pacifist, which I don't understand this at all, but the guy goes into video games and then does not kill anything. I don't know how he levels up. Um, Unless he just levels by grouping with people, uh, but he won't kill anything. Even even in the point where he is about to die, a true death from a monster, he refuses to hurt the monster. Now, I'm all for morals, ethics, and that sort of thing. I think having yourself a fantastic uh, guideline to live by is amazing, and if you can do that, God bless you. But in a video game, it's really stupid to let yourself get killed because you don't want to hurt something that's not real, but you can totally die. So, you know, the characters, they're out there. Uh, you can say they're they're one-dimensional or they're a little flat. I didn't think it was that bad. Honestly, I think they were a little bit just, they were silhouettes more of anything, uh, of certain things, uh, you know, rather than fully fleshed out. I think they could get there. Probably like the, the next book they'll get there. But um, the story is 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 good. It's not bad. Like I say, I think this would be a really good book for young adults to get into. But overall, I had to give it a seven point score just because there were no surprises, uh, and it just took so long getting into the stage of the gameplay. Um, seriously, I've had relationships that didn't last two hours. Just didn't. And, and this book took four to get there. So in spite of the cons, I think that it would be a, you know, a good book to, to have kids listen to. But if the predictability of this series continues or the silhouettes of the characters aren't more fleshed out, I don't think I'll be following along after the book two. Um, I'm going to give it one more shot. Hopefully things will improve a little bit. But for right now, it's a 7.0, and I, I really debated that um, because I, I just felt like the writing was really good. In some spots, it, it, it's well written. It just kind of has like a very, I don't know, like I say, you just kind of know what's going to happen before it happens kind of uh, thing going on for it. And like I say, for kids who haven't read this sort of stuff a million times, that's great. That's great. Um, but here, I think I need one more book. I'll give it a shot and see if things work out better. After that, I'll be done with this series. So that's it. That's all I can tell you. Just make your choices based on that. All right. So our next book is The Renegades, Bard from Barleona by Vasily Mehenenko, translated by Eugenia Dmitrieva and Boris Smirnov, narrated by Andrea Ems with a book length of 11 hours and two minutes. Got up and brushed past Toad on his way to the mirror. What a wreck. 
He made a revolted grimace at his reflection. We're rockers, Michaels, a dying breed. When it comes to the quickly fading epoch of true rock and roll, you could say we're the last of the Mohicans. And here you are, part of the problem. All you seem to want is less lyrics and more cleavage. So let's figure it out once and for all. What do you want, rock or striptease? Why not both? Toad churled. Happily, though, this concluded any further discussion of surgically augmenting the band's creative journey, for the time being at least. All right, Charsky plunked down beside my armchair and gave Toad an unkind glance. Next item. What the feck did you wake us up so early for? Last night we toiled at that corporate gig thing until two, and then went quaffing. And you won't let us sleep it off. All right, so I'm going to come clean here. I'm going to just be right up front and honest with you. I've had this book for a long while now, and I've been kind of struggling to get through it. This is one of those cases where the narrator graded on me so badly that I had to get back and away from the story to a point where I could not even enjoy the tale at all. Um, it was really like I felt like Andrea Ames, and I don't want to sound graphic here, but she just kind of laid there and let the story do all the work. There was no, there was very clearly, there was no love for this project in her, in my opinion. Uh, and there were points where I felt like this was just another assignment that she felt like she had to get through. I honestly beat me, my, beat myself up, okay? I beat myself up over how hardly, how hard I perceived this, okay? Because... It felt very sexist for me to think like it was a prostitute taking money and just walking away when it was all over with. But then I thought I would have felt the same way if it had been a guy because I would have just compared uh, his performance to Richard Gere in American Gigolo or maybe more like Deuce Bigelow, you know, but you get the idea. This was a project that just did not seem to have love emanating from it. It was just kind of like, <sighs> Let's get this over with. Let's just do this. And no kissing. No kissing. It's all from here down. This is for me. This is for me. So um, that's how it felt. And, and I hate to say this. I mean, like I said, I don't really want to beat people up. But this story, I, I could not get through this. I, I seriously struggled time after time to get, get into this book. And it just... I had to force myself to come back and I seriously did not want to finish it. So enough beating her up because I just realized that I have yet another books of hers. Yeah, I do have another book of hers to listen to because I just looked at it when I was doing my notes for the show and it didn't click. I looked at her name and again, like I said, I don't pay attention to those things, but I know um, I have Conquest by uh, R.M. Mulder and I do believe I saw her name there. So I'm going to pray that it works out better for her there than it did here. Maybe she'll like that kind of a story. This one did not seem to have been made for her at all. And I get it's a, it's a female main character. So we're going to use a female narrator, but I'm going to just say this right now. Andrea Parsno has proven it doesn't care. It doesn't matter what gender a person is. A great reader can pull off either gender either way. You know, and, and so like Jeff Hayes, Jeff Hayes is the exact same way. Jeff has like eight female voices that he can pull out of his pocket at any time. Eight, at least. I can just, just boom, boom, boom. He just throws them out there like nothing. And he could do an entire perspective of a female in a story and nail it. <clears throat> Even though he's a guy. For the same way that Andrea can read Wild Waste and Vince <clears throat> and, and just nail his character 100% down the line, even though she is a lady. So it, it did not have to be that way. And I just think that, and I, again, I don't know for certain, but I just, I get the impression that um, <clears throat> they have a deal with some company and they, the company just picks the narrators to fit. And they said, oh, well, the main character is a woman. So we'll just have this woman here do this. Um, I, I don't know, but let me just go ahead and move on before I go crazier. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things I will say about the game is the game mechanics are, well, these explanations, they're a little bit thin for me, okay? But I'm guessing, just guessing, that that is because 
this book is set in the same place as Way of the Shaman. Now, my issue is I haven't read Way of the Shaman, so I need a more detailed idea of how things work. That would have been a nice touch. You can't assume that your your listeners or your readers know everything about this book coming into it. If it's it's a separate book from the main series, you got to put stuff in to give them traction to grab. And it, it was there, but it was, it was pretty thin as far as I was concerned because I know they added stuff, you know, like the bard class, I think, and or at least her race, which is the biota. I know that was a new race in the game. And <clears throat> I would have liked to have known what the other stuff was, you know, in a greater detail. Things like that uh, just throw me in a, more of a bone. Give me a lot more than just like, you know, here's this, that, and the other thing, and you can just run with it. I need a little bit more info. But, you know, it, <clears throat> it wasn't that I couldn't follow along. I would have just liked more. That's all I'm saying. <clears throat> Another thing, and again, I kept stepping away from this book periodically, so I might be off on this, is that the MC, the main character, and I can't remember her name either because I just kept stopping and stopping and stopping, um, had a very by-the-books approach to how she did things. And then at the end, all of her strategy was kind of tossed out the window at the last second. And I don't understand why. Now, I do think <clears throat> the twist that caused this wasn't too bad. Um, but it, it might be just like something that I forgot from taking breaks from the book. But because <clears throat> I was listening at it like maybe about an hour at most or less at a time. Um, it was just weird to see how she did everything. Right? Like, I have to do this, 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 and this. And they get to the end and it just craps out on a whole process of doing things. It, it was it was good for the story. Like I say, there was a twist to it. There were reasons. But it was just kind of weird to just see somebody give up their strategy or their way of doing things so easily. I would I would have assumed that there would have been a lot more going on there. Uh, <clears throat> now, really, I honestly feel bad about doing this review because I don't think the story had much of a chance in competition with this narration. You want me to be really honest? I can't remember a single name of any of the characters in the book. I couldn't even tell you the band name, okay? Because that's what it's about. It's about a band that goes into a video game, uh, <clears throat> and they go in so the lead singer can get some inspiration and have some fun, and they 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 do that. They have their fun, and she gets her inspiration and stuff. But I can't, for the life of me, and I just listened to this five, six days ago, I can't remember a single character in the book. Not a one. Uh, and then that tells me a lot right there. When I can't retain something, I don't think it's because though of the writing. I don't believe it was the writing that did it. Because I could not take Andrea uh, M's narration at all. It's just something about it. <clears throat> it got me. And like I said, I know that, you know, these publishing houses that give you the option, you know, let us do this for you and we don't charge you anything and we get X amount of dollars. That's great because sometimes it's a hit. Uh, I know AJ Markham caught Iggy Toma for Succubus by complete chance. He had no, nothing to do with that decision whatsoever. Um, and this is the other end of the spectrum. You know, I don't believe that uh, the writer would have made this decision to go with her if he had listened to her for any period of time. Now, I could be wrong. And I don't know what anybody else thinks of this because... This is my opinion, uh, and, and for me, the narration is what makes or breaks a book. And this one really crushed it. Uh, I know I, I'm, I'm going to come down kind of hard on Zombie Slayer a little bit with the narration there, but here, holy cow, I, I, I just did not, I could not listen to it. <sighs> my final score is 6.5 stars. And I will say the written word probably will translate far better than it has here audibly. Well, okay, next up is the book Zombie Slayer, a lit RPG audiobook apocalypse by Cameron Milan, narrated by Steve McCutcheon, with a book length of 7 hours and 52 minutes. The day slowly passed. Everybody was on edge, and most of the classes ended up being free time. That was the worst for Eric. He wasn't an avid reader, so he was bored the entire day. At 1.29 p.m., a screen appeared in front of Eric. 
He thought he was asleep at first, but when he heard audible gasps coming from around him, he knew it was real. He read what was on the rectangular screen. System initializing. Stand by. A girl who sat next to him, Rebecca, exclaimed in shock, What is this? Can you guys see this? Eric looked over and found he could see the screen in front of her as well. The message was the same as his. He immediately noticed that his screen followed his line of sight. So, you know, I am a big horror fan. I'm working on a horror story right now myself. I've got a couple on um, Amazon that are just shorts that are free and Kindle. Um, so I'm, I love horror. I, I am a big fan of survival horror. Uh, so anytime I get a chance to get something, and of course, if you ever look up anything that I've done uh, in the horror world, uh, you'll, you'll see like if, if you go to anything that my, my username is zombie dude 1313 so if you see zombie dude 1313 or zd 1313 that's me uh that's because i like zombies i grew up i was weaned on the night of the living dead i'll never forget the night i watched that movie um with my aunt and uncle and my cousin uh, we were at their home so of course i had to be in a strange place it had to be incredibly dark uh it was raining outside uh and we watched the original night of the living dead and you gotta realize, I was just a wee lad at that time, and uh, it freaked my Aunt Donna out so much, because I was sleeping on the couch downstairs, that she consistently, continually, the whole night, would come downstairs and check the doors and make sure the doors were locked and check the windows. And it, and it scared me, because I was like, holy crap, if she's afraid there's zombies going to be getting into the house... Well, they might be real. So, like, for the whole night, I did not sleep. I was up. I was awake. And all I could think of was, any second now, I'm going to hear, you know, this thump, thump, thump on the door. And zombies are be coming in and biting my behind. And I'm done. That's all over for Big Ray. Right? Okay? So, I... I don't know why, but it made me fall in love with zombies. The, the, you're, they're coming to get you, Barbara. They're coming to get you, Barbara. I have memorabilia from the movie. I mean, I, I grew up and lived near Pittsburgh. Um, so I've got signatures and pictures and things like that. Even the uh, remake in 1990, um, Pat Tallman, I've got a, an autographed picture of her holding a shotgun. I love it. It's one of my biggest treasures. So when you put lit RPG and horror together, I'm going to be there. But you slap in some zombies, and man, I'm on that. Like, well, like, like. Like flies on poop, I guess, because they don't really like honey, but they love poop. So anyway, um, I saw this and I said, I've got to get this book and get through it as quickly as I can. And I've got a, I've got this huge backlog. I mean, <laughs> you know, people will say, can you, can you, can you check this out? Look at this book. And I've got, you know, Jeff saying, get this book, get this book, get this book. And I'm like, okay, I've got all these books to get to. So I've got like a three week or more backup, a backlog of books I've got to listen to. So. As soon as I can, I get to them, and, and I don't jump ahead. I really don't. Uh, as much as I'd like to, I'd like to say, man, I've been waiting for Divine Dungeon to come out, and I have all these other books ahead of them, so I do keep it in the queue, so to speak. It's kind of like that Netflix queue they used to have back when you get those little DVDs in the mail, and you'd wait, and sometimes you'd cheat and jump up one, and I don't do that stuff. I just let it ride until it gets to where it needs to be. And I do the same thing because it's not fair for somebody who gets something something out earlier uh, and they have to wait because something I'm really anticipating. So, uh, you know, let's just say, for example, like say Divine Dungeon, um, where that pops out and I put that ahead just because it's a book I really, really know I want to listen to or read. Uh, I don't do that. So it goes in order. And so I've been waiting to get to this book. So if you may remember, Cameron Milan, um, wrote the desire books which is where people with tattoos got superpowers from the tattoos and then in book two uh there was this hyper evil super orc that came to earth and you know they had to fight this evil orc and then some of the other heroes turned evil and, and that sort of thing um i hadn't realized he had written this I had not because i usually just grab books i'm like okay that's that looks good that's lit rpg that's game lit that's lit rpg I get them in unless somebody says, can you check this out? Or Jeff says, you know, here's, here, here's some stuff. Get these books right here. We're good. So, so I do that. And as time goes on, um, I, I get to kind of get, get the surprise of, Oh, I didn't know, like, you know, Andrea Parsno narrated this book or, you know, uh, 
Dakota Kraut road to completionist. I had no clue. I had no clue. So, you know, as time goes on, I get to, to see these things as, as it just pops up. And I had no clue that Cameron Milan had done this. So, you know, I came into this with no expectations. And the truth is, um, you know, um, with this book, um, as, as I did things, I knew it was Cameron Milan by the second chapter because I just clicked it on and, then, and just, just listened to it. And I always kind of just skipped the first. This is Audible. And it says, Zombie Slayer, a little RPG apocalypse by, you know, I don't listen to that. I just go right into the chapter one because uh, I don't have time for all that, you know, ain't got time for that. So I go into it. And, you know, like I say, I tend to notice it the books if they are by authors that I know or by narrators. So like Jeff Hayes or Sound Booth Theater, Dave Wilmore, Andrew Parsnow, Luke Daniels, James Hunter, Charles Dean. Those books I recognize where I'm anticipating. So I know those ones are coming out. But, you know, smaller books or new new people, I don't pay attention until afterwards because I, I want to keep an open mind. So with this one, I was kind of shocked. And I was like, wait, I know this writing style. I know it really, really well because I've, I've reviewed two of his books. And I know basically how this guy writes. And and so I said, it's Cameron Milan. And I went back and checked. I did cheat just to make sure I wasn't you know crazy. And sure enough, it was him. So kudos for me for picking up his writing style, I guess. Um, but like I say, for the most part, I do blind grabs. And as an example, I just reviewed like Advent. And I had no idea that Luke Daniels had been the narrator uh, until I heard him speak. And I'm like, well, holy crap. You know, so things do fly under my radar. Um, but, you know, I, I even though here I've read several of Cameron Malone's books, I, I don't go out of my way to look for him. Okay, I'm not saying anything negative. It's just he's not like clobbered me with amazingness so far i've read his books and i've okay i've, I've read two of them um and it's kind of like a bologna sandwich I, i'll eat one if someone hands it to me but i don't go out of my way looking for a bologna sandwich it just kind of happens either you know my wife says we have bologna here today eat this sandwich for lunch or i don't get bologna sandwiches uh, and it's the same thing here i just did not realize it was camera Milan, so i wasn't anticipating anything so like i said i recognize the style uh two chapters in and the reason is, is his writing is pretty much story over substance. And, and what I mean by that is, is he gives you a lot of flash, but there's not a lot of depth in what goes on. He gets an idea. It's an interesting idea. But then his characters, and I mean, all of his characters are really one or two dimensional creations. They don't seem to have any distinct personalities. And that goes from the, the main character right down to the faceless NPC who gets, you know, chomped by a zombie three sentences after the zombies attack. Uh, they are all very interchangeable in their actions. Honestly, and I mean, this, there were two characters who were friends at the start of the book. Um, and it was the, and the, the main character and then his best buddy. And unless the main character, and I can't remember his name. I'm sorry, it's just, it's just forgettable. I can't remember his name. I want to say it was Eric, but I don't quote me on that. But unless the main character was literally saying, you know, this is the main character here. I couldn't remember which was which. Like when their name popped up and they were talking about the guy, I had no clue what they were talking about. So so basically, here's a rundown of the book. The Earth passes through a strange interstellar cloud that places it and its inhabitants into a video game styled event. They are given the zombie apocalypse to contend with as the the game that they chose, so to speak. You know, it says, you know, this game has been chosen. So that's the the game they have to fight against is the zombie apocalypse. And all I can say is, is at that with the rate of attrition at their fortified location, if it is it is so if it is equal to what happens around the rest of the world, the the, the rate of attrition is so high that humanity would pretty much be roadkill within probably a month. But I'll, I'll be nice and say within six months, there won't be a human left alive because they go from, you know, 800 kids to 100 kids to none of them. So it was just really bizarre how easily it was to kill them off and then consider that there's still this this possibility humanity was going to survive. Now, one aspect, the book does remind me, and like I said, I've read a lot of books, so I'm going to just throw this out there. Uh, it reminds me of an old zombie novel 
called Skeletons by Al Serantonio. And pretty much the same thing happened there. Uh, the Earth passes through an interstellar cloud and the dead rise as intelligent skeletons uh, there and they start killing everybody. And these, these skeletons have like a haze of who the person was before them. You know, so what happens is, is um, everybody who's ever died, and I mean everybody, comes back to life. And the, the zombies hate the living and they start killing all the live people. And the only person that like realizes that if, if things continue, the human race is gone is Abraham Lincoln, who has come back from the dead. Um, and he, this is after um, Richard Nixon has been assassinated in, in the presidency and so on and so forth. Um, and Lincoln kind of steps into the presidential stu- shoes, so to speak, again. And so he fights to save at least two humans from utter, complete extinction. Uh, that was the book. So... The, the, the whole thing with the entering the cloud, and, and the whole premise of that was that happens every so many millions of years, and the last time it happened was when the dinosaurs had gone through it. So, you know, the interstellar cloud thing and then the undead, it just kind of really clicked in my head, and that was a, really the only connection. But I, I really wonder if Milan read that book uh, because it was just so, I don't know how to put it anyway, it was so strange an idea for two writers to have the same concept of like this is what raises the dead and the cloud does this i don't know because as soon as they pass out of the cloud it's all done and that's on both books so um the way it worked was you know i just kind of suspected he kind of got this idea for it, which is fine because it's a good book but i just, just thought it was weird i just wanted to bring that up and point it out so another thing is you know I like it when characters die, but deaths need to sort of serve some sort of a purpose. Some can be used to show how dangerous the situation is. Um, Some should be emotional. Some should drive a character in another direction or just jar the reader. Like you need to have like this zombie jump up and bite somebody's face off. That's great. It needed to happen. I don't want one of those stupid cats jump off the trash can in the alley. Things, you know, I want like real things happening, but Here, the characters, and I hate to sound like this, they were just like, they were just picking numbers and lining up to become a zombie child. Uh, there, there was no depth to them at all. And, and, and here's, here's where I I will say, like, with the main character, uh, at the start of the book, and here's where I say, okay, the, the setup was, was there. Uh, he lives at home with his mother, his sister, and his almost invalid grandmother. She can't do anything for herself, and, and that's why they live with her. And he's at school when this zombie apocalypse starts and he gets really concerned about his mother and his, his family. So he like does everything he can to get back there to save them and get them back to the school uh, in order to preserve their lives. And then you go like 10 zombie attacks in which the school is overrun several times. And at no point, and it wasn't exactly 10, but you get my point. Uh, no point does he ever say, oh, I wonder if mom or grandma are okay. And then when they do show up, it's kind of like, yeah, mom stopped by to give me a bologna sandwich, you know? So it, it was just weird how that was, because like I say, um, with Milan, uh, I, I just almost broke into a Disney song with Milan. Because it's Milan and not Mulan. But, okay, anyway, I got to keep focused here, folks. Um, as things went, he only focused on leveling up, empowering his character up. Just like in the Desire books. If you've read the Desire books, all the characters that are superheroes, all they do is struggle to become super duper more powerful than the Dragon Ball Z guy that comes down and destroys everybody, uh, you know, Goku, because he's so powerful uh, and can crush a planet with his eye blink. Well, they've got to be stronger. That's how his characters are, and that's how they were in Desire, and that's how it is here. Um, the main character, he does nothing but go out and grind night after night after night after night after night in this attempt to make himself more powerful. And, it, you know, it, it just made it where every character in the book had this blank face to me. I, I just did not see, you know, anything there with them at all. Um, you know, so it, it was just like really... If you like grinding, then this is a good book for you because there's not a lot of characterization and there's not a lot of depth to the characters that are there. Um, 
But the book grinds a hell of a lot. He's got he's got the lit stuff going on, uh, and he does level up and power up until he's like the most powerful human on the planet. Uh, but it's a never-ending quest for power. That's just what this book is. So at least Milan is consistent. Uh, this is basically just a character grinding for about 80% of the book until he faces off against a big bad at the end. And that's it. There's nothing else to it. I mean, if you want to know the truth of it, there, there is not anything else going on in the book other than the grind to get to the end where he has to fight a super powerful monster. And he's really good with beating monsters who are like way up in his levels. He can figure stuff out and do things, which is fine. Every It seems like every little RPG book you read, uh, the characters are fighting something that's five times their level and they still win. So I have no problem with that. And this is, this is a one character kind of thing. And, and I will say this. In his defense, um, I like solo characters. I do. Uh, he just kind of ran into an issue with there wasn't a lot other than for the solo character to get out and, and deal with. Uh, you know, he just went ahead. He had to go fight the evil humans or he had to go meet the vampire out in the parking lot every so often or whatever it was. Um, that That's it. I like the solo aspect of it a lot. I just wish he could have given the character a little bit more depth. And I think that's what, and, and like I say, I think Milan could become like a really, really, really good writer if he would step back away from the, the story and focused on the characters for a little bit, give them motivations, give them, you know, uh, backstories that are interesting, give them emotions uh, that are, are real, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Because it, there were scenes in, in the, the story where, you know, they were recounting how somebody got killed in, in a, a shop and there was, it was just literally, there was no emotion to it. And, and of course, I'm going to say why I think I think part of it is the narration by Steve McCutcheon. Um, his narration is really stilted and utterly lifeless. You know, lately I've been saying um, a hell of a lot. I've been saying that people were middle of the pack narrators, and I don't think this fellow makes it that far. Uh, and I don't want to be rude or destroy somebody, but I'm going to have to be honest with you. I did not enjoy um, listening to him, and it was not because he did not speak clearly or speak intelligently or but he, he there was no emotion to his story whatsoever he threw out a couple of voices here and there but it was not really where i said okay these are very distinctive you know every character there to be fair about it was so two-dimensional he could have used the same voice for five people and you wouldn't have noticed because who the hell were they talking anyway? I think if you had the book in front of you and we're looking at names and you had that right there the whole time and you can go back and refer, you might be able to say, okay, I can follow who these people are. Here, it's just a swirl of, of voice replacing, you know, one person after another. And it was so, so stilted. And, and, and there were parts of the books that repeated very short lines. Um, and his reading is, I have to say, his reading's as good as my son in high school when he reads to his brothers at night. Okay. And that ain't stellar, but it ain't bad. Um, you know, the kids, they'll cry. You know, my, my, my kids will cry and ask that we play heavy metal music to put them to sleep rather than have my son read them anymore. And that's, 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 that's not true that they actually ask for death metal. And I told them that we live in a funeral home. So all metal played here is death metal. And that kind of mollified them, I guess a little bit, but yeah, um, I'm not a fan of his at all. Really not, um, I, you know, and I don't want to be like Johnny Dangerously and say, you bore me. But <coughs> me having a hard time talking now, uh, he did. He, he just kind of just drained the life out of that story for me. And I, again, I think a better narrator could have carried that story a little bit further, could have added some depth with his characterizations. But I didn't enjoy McCutcheon much at all in this. It was just kind of meh. So my final score is six stars. Six stars. Okay, I'm sorry, but we characters muddled narration made this pretty unfun. As much as I like zombies and horror and scary stuff and there were neat, neat new zombies in here and all that, I just did not enjoy this book much more than I did desire. And I'm pretty much done with that series. Okay, so six stars. It's the best I could come up with. So, you know, I think today... 
it was kind of a sad day because I think I, I kind of like really struggled to get through a couple of these books, um, which, like I said, I, all of them were readable. Well, not all of them. I couldn't listen to the Bard, um, but they were all you know lower scoring books, and it, it had nothing to do with like my choice of doing that, putting them all together. It just kind of fell into this is where I'm listening to right now, and this is where we're going. So I just needed to say. Um, Let's do something different. And I know I've done a lot of uh, Is It Lit books lately. I've done a lot more than What Else Have They Done. Uh, so here is my What Else Have They Done segment. Today I'm going to focus on Terry Irvin II, um, who writes one of my favorite Gamelet series, uh, the Monsters, Maces, and Magic series. Uh, he just did uh, Betrayal and Guild. Those were his newest ones in that series. And I really do enjoy it a lot. Today I'm going to focus on something else. It's kind of got a fantasy bent to it, um, to a certain extent. Uh, it is called Flank Hawk, and it is, of course, written by Terry W. Irvin II, narrated by Michael A. Slusner, Slusser, Slusser, Michael A. Slusser. There we go. Uh, with a book length of 13 hours and 25 minutes. Waiting's over, warned Road Toad. Looking to where he pointed, I spotted a small bunch of zombies, no more than seven in each group, spaced at least five yards apart and seemingly in haphazard order, dozens of these mini-hordes emerged from the woods. Heedless of the diving dragons, they shambled toward the trench line and earthen mound defenses. They've got timber to span the trench, I said. Two zombies in each group carried paired eight-inch diameter logs lashed together. More and more scattered groups of zombies followed on the heels of the first wave. They're serious. When the zombies had covered two hundred yards, one of the red dragons swept down upon them. The serpent cavalryman hunched low against his mount. The rear-facing rider leaned hard against his heavy crossbow, mounted on a squat tripod held in place by broad leather tracings. The dragon smashed and scattered one zombie bunch with its tail while breathing a jet of flame. So, I mean, honestly, Terry Irvin is just crushing it for me. I started out in the Lit RPG series, a story of his called Outpost, and I just adored the book. I loved it. Uh, and then I read his novel, Relic Hunter, and I was amazed just how flexible his storytelling chops really were. And now he hit me with this fantasy novel that deals with undead and Nazi planes and tanks. Well, huh? Well, who the heck thinks this stuff up? I'll tell you who. Terry Irvin II. Uh, anyway, I, I must say his, his imagination must be fueled by Token's sweat, Willy Wonka's blood, and Clint Eastwood's attitude. Uh, it is a crazy mix, to be certain, but it's a combination that makes for some amazing possibilities. Uh, I really do enjoy Irvin a lot, and, and his Relic Hunter series was one that I debated. Should I do this one, or should I do this one? Um, and, and to be frank with you, I, I really enjoy the Relic Hunter. I don't want you to even think that I don't. Um, I'm more of a fantasy bend kind of person. Um, sci-fi is great. I love sci-fi. But if you said, read this book or this book, and this is a fantasy book, and this is a sci-fi book, and they're of equal uh, skill and talent uh, and style, I'm going to go for the fantasy every time. Uh, so I had to, to just kind of go this way. Uh, so now here's the deal. Flank Hawk. He's an everyman, not a hawking hero or deadly warrior. He's just kind of a guy swept up in circumstances that sweep him away from the life he would prefer. Still, he makes do with a lot and manages to actually become someone of consequence. In this case, history isn't repeating itself so much as, how would you put it, reinventing, reinventing itself. Um, fantasy and science begin to gel together, leaving the world a far different place than it had been before. Flyhawk has the honor of being the one who has to bear the responsibility of stopping this massive war. And, and this is where I want to say the creativity really comes out here. It really does. I, I think that it reminds me of Van Stry's book, um, and I can't think of the name of the series right now, and I'm sorry for that, but um, and it's not Portals to Infinity, I don't think. Um, but it's where a guy from the military ends up with his superior uh, crashing into this other world, and um, they have responsibility. They get, they get magic and things like that. They do a lot of different things over there. This this kind of has that kind of a feel because there there was um, 
it was actually in the future for them, but uh, with magic involved, uh, it, it's the mix of magic and science, like Thundar. If you ever watched Thundar the Barbarian, you know, as a kid, it, you know, Thundar was like awesome because it was Conan mixed with like weird gamma world apocalypse stuff, you know, super science and fantasy, ma- you know, super science and magic meet, you know, and that was it. And this, this reminds me a lot of that in some ways because you just don't have panzers, you know, blowing people up and then, you know, magic flying around. Um, the one thing I did have, um, a little issue with was the character of Lily and Flank Hawk is there to help and protect her. And there was literally, literally no sexual tension between them at all. Now I would have liked to have seen some interest or some spark. Um, because if you consider Flank Hawk has been celibate for, for more than a while, uh, it is more than likely that he might do something, you know, some initiating of something with her. Uh, he, he might be more than, you know, he might be interested just for one night, if nothing else. Um, even if he was pious and holy, he would still be moved when she was undressed. So, you know, he could do things, and but it, it just seemed a little bit unbelievable to me that there was no hint, no spark, um, nothing there for him to, for either of them, to, like, find some common ground for a little bit even. Even just to say, like, you know, I respect this person. I like that person. I think that we could do maybe something later on. There wasn't that, but that is, that's just like a niggling little stupid thing that was in my head as I read this. Okay. Um, because (sighs) aside from that, the action, the action makes this book worth it. It really does. But then you have the characterization and the whole concept of fighting orcs and zombies and panzers. All at the same time. It's really good stuff. Michael A. Slusner does the narration. And I'm very glad to see that Irvin rotates his readers out for various, his, you know, series. And by readers, I mean narrators. This man reads the story. Uh, this gives each story its own tone. Um, because, it, you know, each book needs its own voice. It's kind of like covers. You know, I think to make yourself distinctive, your cover of your, your one series should stand out as this series only. And the next cover for the other series should just be, so you can look at them and say, I know that is this series. Like this is Flank Hawk. This is Mazes, Magic and Monsters. Um, or, you know, however it goes. And, and there's no question. You pick out these things. You've got them. You've got them nailed down. And, um, it should stand out. And it's the same thing with the narrators. Um, I, I do like when you have some variety. But if you've got a really good narrator and you're happy with him, stick with him. That's what I say. But um, I do like that he rotates it uh, because it, it gives each book its own flavor, its own character. Uh, and and Slusser comes in as a favorite of mine. I, I haven't heard him prior, but I really enjoyed his work and his voice and the emotions that he provided to each of the characters. Now, I never noticed any sound issues, and I felt that I could happily listen to him for another few novels. So, you know, there it is. Um, the book is solid and interesting it's entertaining don't miss out and like i say this is just my way of saying check this book out check out this series there's more out there than lit rpg from some of our writers um you know if you look at it uh what blaze corvin and dakota crop or not dakota crop but william moran did with the veil verse it, it it really you know Rand is um into that cultivating the usha stuff in that book and it's really it's it's incredible it's amazing but it's not very lit rpg i mean you could call it that you could slot it in there but you don't have that lit feel as much um and the same thing with with uh asgard awakening it's lit but it's it's a further side from lit um and i think that everybody deserves to take a break like james hunter has his yancey lazarus series which i really love i love yancey lazarus um Domino Finn has his urban, you know, fantasy novel out there. And, and it's not going to come to my head right now. I'm so sorry, Domino. I really, I apologize. I will do a, what else have they done for your, your books soon? Um, but, but <sighs> the fact of the matter is everybody out there should look into, if you like this guy's writing, like I said, I really enjoyed, you know, the fantasy world of MMM. And so I did go out and get the other books uh, just because they're so awesome and they're so fun. And I think you would really enjoy this. And again, I 
do not give a score here. Uh, this is just for a heads up for you all in the community to kind of get a flavor for something new and different. So this is up to you. If you, you really want to see what the score is, go check it out. Um, it's going to be good. <clears throat> but um, it's more important to check the book out more than anything. Uh, and if you like MMM and you like this, check out his other stuff. He, he's got Relic Hunter. And there's there's other books, too, that he has done. Uh, they're not all lit RPG, or, or I should say they're not all game lit you would have a heck of a good time reading them or listening to them. So go give them a look. Um, and like I say, if you're an author out there and you've done lit RPG, but you've also done something else, uh, and you think that I should do it, what else have they done for you? Let me know. I have no problem doing that. Uh, again, it, it narrators too. You know, I have done, you know, Jeff Hayes, he, he did the, the hit, hit list. Uh, I've done that for him uh, because I love that book, but it's not lit RPG. That was why I went into this, uh, because you guys do things outside of the genre that deserves a look. It really does. Yeah, I think I, I did. I can't remember who I did it for. Well, it was Andrea Parr Snow or Harmon Cooper. Uh, I think it was Cooper who I did it for. Um, but you know the uh, the the apocalyptic book, um, really good. So you you need to go back and just say you know just because it's not lit, I can't read this. No, this is, this is what it's for. Broaden your horizons. Broaden them. So enjoy this book. This series, is it's fun. You'll like it. I really, I promise you will. And get out there and pick this up. Well, that's our show today. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'd like to thank you so very much for doing so. I do appreciate it when you take the time to watch or listen to the show. Uh, if you would like to support the program, and I hope you do, uh, I'd ask if you could to please like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page. We do have those. Uh, or just share and like this video. That helps a lot, too. It gets the, the message out there, so to speak. Uh, I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed our show. Uh, please leave comments or suggestions in the section below down there. That down there, Gilbert. Um, and feel free to tell me whatever you think about the show. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. You can tell me I suck or my haircut is really crappy. Uh, I will take the feedback to heart and try to do what I can to make things better next time around. Uh, I'd like to remind you that you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So remember, please leave a uh, review for any book that you have listened to or read. Authors really depend on those reviews. Thank you very much, everyone, for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray. Keep listening.